this time when things have been so difficult, this congregation has remained faithful in its financial giving and the meeting of its obligations to our congregation. And your session has a lot to worry about. Your session has a lot to think about and plan and, and consider with things so different than they normally are. Um, but as we get our financial report so well prepared for us each month, we see that our income is meeting all of our expenses. And so that is not one of the things they're having to worry about. And so anybody who's been in a position of responsibility knows what a great relief that is. Um, I would remind folks that um, we are not passing offering plates during this time, um, but there are a variety of ways that you can give. Um, we have at the back of each row, um, some people like to give as they come or give as they leave. For some people, the act of placing uh, an offering, an offering dedicated to God, um, someplace is, a, is an important activity, an act of worship. Worship is physical as well as it is um, mental and, and emotional. And so some folks appreciate that. Others um, have told me that um, preparing an envelope and sending an offering in through the mail has become a time of devotion for them. They use that as a time to pray for the church, to pray for staff, to pray for our ministry, to pray for our impact in our community. So um, some people have found that to, to be an added devotional time for them. Um, others um, like the ease of setting up automatic transfers where um, the money just electronically goes from your account to the church account um, as if by magic um, every, every month. And some people um, find that particularly people who travel or um, aren't keeping checkbooks as much as they used to are finding that an easy way to give. Also, you can go to our church website, www.pc.org, find the donate button and you can give online as well. And we have seen, we have established that during, during this time of distancing. So let me say thank you on behalf of the session, on behalf of the elders. Um, thank you for your steadfastness in remaining faithful in giving to the ministry of our congregation. Um, I would just say that in some ways our, our outreach into our community has actually expanded during this time. We've had um, many of the AA groups that met in other places are no longer allowed to meet in those buildings, so they've relocated here, and we adjust other things in the life of our church, and we, um, and we balance all of their needs out with the needs of others, and we're able to accommodate all of those AA groups at a time when people who suffer from addiction are finding it um, easier to give in to that addiction. We want to be here. We consider that an essential service to so many in our community. And by your faithful giving, you allow us to um, do that securely, safely, um, turn the heat on, turn the air conditioning on. Also, um, the Red Cross, which uses our place for blood drives, has increased the number of times that they're coming each month. Um, they have a greater need and they have fewer places opening their doors to them. So the fact that you give and enable us to continue in our ministry is a, is a great outreach. We continue through our pantry shelf to distribute food um, and we're doing that differently than we have before, um, but that continues. Um, our outreach to the Christian Aid Center and the preparing of meals there continues. Something we normally do at the beginning of the summer, Mission Mission Walla Walla, where our youth go and do acts of compassion and of kindness in our community, acts of service. Um, it took us a while to figure out how to do that safely. Um, it was moved to the end of the summer rather than the beginning of summer, but it still happened. Um, and when things open back up, when things go back to normal, I think we're going to see that there's been a lot more um, harm done to families. There's going to be a lot more um, pain and suffering that's gone on than we see right now, and our community will need us now more than ever when that time comes. And so thank you for your faithful giving that while many of our programs and um, things have had to be discontinued, we've not diminished our outreach one bit, our ministries of compassion. And so um, we look forward to the resumption of activities, but thank you for your faithful giving, because when we will be needed, we'll be here, and we'll be here because you've been so faithful. I also want to um, welcome Facebook that has joined with us as I invite all of us who are gathered here in the, in the service, um, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. We're going to be looking in some ways at the entirety of Genesis chapter 2, but we're going to be reading from the beginning and the end of Genesis chapter 2. Our first verses are Genesis 2, 1 through 4. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. 
And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Continuing and picking up in verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every animal of the field and bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called them, every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to all the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. And then he took out one of his ribs and closed its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman. For out of man this one was taken. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. Friends, brothers, and sisters in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. With the close of the first chapter of the book of Genesis, the stage has been set. The spotlight of Genesis is the second chapter as it shines fully on humanity whom God created in his image to play a lead role in all of history. Shakespeare said it this way, All the world is a stage. And he added that the people on it are merely players. He went on to outline with keen insight and savage humor the seven acts or ages of man that man passes through, beginning with infant and ending with sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. That's certainly one way of looking at humanity. But Genesis chapter 2 has much more to offer than even Shakespeare did. As we look into this chapter's teaching on God's masterpiece, as we look into this chapter's teaching on the creation of humanity, we see a number of things, and it should be pointed out that some scholars talk about two creation accounts, one creation account in chapter 1 of the book of Genesis and a second and separate creation account as chapter 2. I believe the writer of Genesis uses a simple technique of introducing a subject in general terms, and then placing most of that on the side to dive deeper into something of a more particular interest. This is certainly true, I believe, in the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. In addition, it should be noted that the New Testament draws freely from both the first and second chapter of the book of Genesis on many occasions and quotes them both without differentiation. The New Testament witness is that Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 aren't two separate accounts but one consistent whole to be seen and understood that way. For example, the Lord Jesus' famous teaching on marriage in Mark chapter 10 verses 6 through 7 draws from both the first chapter of the book of Genesis and the second chapter of the book of Genesis. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female, quoting from Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined into his wife, quoting from Genesis chapter 2, 24. Jesus goes back and forth between both chapters as though they are one account because that's what they are. 
They are one account. And the way the writer of the book of Genesis structures it demonstrates the unity of the whole of Genesis 1, 2, and 3, rather than two separate accounts of creation taken from different sources and merely placed side by side as comparisons, as some scholars would suggest. In fact, I think in the broadest terms, we can look at Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and outline them this way. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, details and describes how God created the heavens and the earth, a finished event. Then in verses 2 through 31 of Genesis 1, God unpacks how he made the the land, this place, um, thriving and capable for humanity to live on it and to flourish in his creation. And then once he has done that, he says, let's dive deeper into looking at humanity. So in chapter 2, God gets to the issue of humanity more closely under a more closer microscopic look. So what we see is God begins with the broadest issue and goes a little further, a little narrower in the rest of chapter 1. Then in chapter 2, God goes more narrowly, looking at a specific part of his creation, specifically humanity, and how the rest of that creation relates to humanity. It takes center stage. God is making it clear he has designed this world for the crown of his creation, humanity. And then tells us how we were created and why we were created. God made everything for humanity to flourish and to thrive in his good world. And so from Genesis chapter 2, there are a number of things we learn about man. But I think it's important for us to to first stop and, and see that We cannot understand ourselves until we first understand God. John Calvin put it this way in the introduction to his Institutes of the Christian Religion. He said, there can be no proper understanding of self without first understanding God. You have to understand the creator before you can have any understanding of the created. You have to know who God is if you ever hope to ever understand yourself. You might look at that person who looks back at you in the mirror or look back at photos of yourself or think about your life and say, who am I? In fact, the group, the who. Ask that question in the 60s. Who am I? Who, who? Who am I? Some of you might remember it. Well, we can't understand who we are without first understanding who God is. So Genesis chapter 1 sets the stage. God is creator. God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. God is all-powerful. God is loving and gracious and kind. And that gets unpacked as we go throughout the rest of Scripture. But now having a glimpse of who God is, we're going to delve more deeply into who humanity is. And that takes sharper focus in the second chapter of Genesis. First, we learn that man is a natural being. Humanity, we are natural beings. The first thing we learn about the actual physical creation of humanity is that the Lord God formed humanity of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being, verse 7. The simplicity of this description, when placed alongside the complex theories and brilliant dissertations, which are the products of man's incessant search for discovery, of everything, including himself, how we are created physically and what makes us tick emotionally and psychologically. When we see this profound statement placed upon and beside all of that, we see that this statement in Genesis is elastic enough to encompass what we have or what we ever will learn about humanity. We have been created from the dust and God breathed life into us. Whatever we learn is just learning a little bit more about that. Briscoe points out that the Bible states unequivocally that humanity, like the animals, comes from the dust, dust of the ground, and moreover will return to the dust. We'll read next week in chapter 3. Coder and Howe, in their book, The Bible, Science, and Creation, have taken the trouble to calculate that the human body is composed of about 
eight pounds of oxygen, two ounces of salt, 50 quarts of water, three pounds of calcium, 24 pounds of carbon, and some chlorine, phosphorus, fat, iron, sulfur, and glycerin. Of course, it's one thing to make a pile of all these common elements. It's a completely different thing altogether to make a human and have those things become human. The scriptures make the point plainly. Humanity was fearfully and wonderfully made. We were constructed for a purpose and a destiny and a grandeur. We're not just some accidents of piles of stuff. God breathed life into the stuff of creation and humanity is the result. The scriptures say that from the humble beginnings and dust, humanity came to be as brilliant as Einstein, as creative as Mozart, and as beautiful as Helen of Troy. The scriptures unequivocally point to the masterly hand of the Lord God. To underemphasize our dustness would be divorce humanity from God ordained truth. To say we are merely spiritual beings and nothing else is to deny the reality put plainly in Genesis chapter 2. God values the stuff, the dust of creation. And if we need any evidence to understand just how much God values our physicalness and our humanity, God became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. God entered into our dustness our naturalness, in order to fully demonstrate and articulate and make visible the glory and the wonder of God. God cares what we do in our flesh and to and with the flesh of one another. These things matter to God because it is part of his good creation. We can't simply lay that part aside and say only what God cares about is the spiritual. That would be a heresy among the highest order. The church has gotten into those kinds of heresies before and we need to steer clear from them. That's why when we sin in our flesh, it grieves God. Because God made the dust and the stuff of our humanity. When we read this, that God breathed life into our dustness, it may also lead us to become arrogant, a condition which can be quickly remedied when, we, when one is confronted with the inevitability of our demise and the subsequent process which will return us to our dustness. One of the most poignant moments ever when I gather with a family at the time of burial is when we get to the part of the service where I say earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust. We need to be reminded from the dust you have come and so to the dust you shall return. Lest we become too arrogant and we think of ourselves as our own masters. We were made by one other God and so to God alone we give all divorce, devotion Glory, honor, and praise. Paul Tournier, in one of his books, tells how he, as a resident of Switzerland, was used to seeing the Matterhorn from the perspective where it leaned to the left. So one day he was looking and he saw a poster depicting the mountain, but it was leaning to the right. He said, this must be a mistake. The Matterhorn leans to the left until it was brought to his attention that the poster was produced by someone who lived in Italy. And if in, you're in Italy, the Matterhorn leans to the right, not to the left. You see, it's a matter of perspective often, isn't it? About how we understand our reality. In the same way, humanity can be viewed from different perspectives. Yes, we are natural. We are from the dust. But we are also spiritual. 
If the word formed gives the impression that God was something of a technician when he was making humanity, the word breathed into us should do away with any thought that God was somehow distant and remote from his creation when we were made. It's a picture of delightful intimacy. When God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Some of our early founders of our country were deists. They believed that God was a creator, but was a hands-off creator, not involved in creation. Well, the Bible tells a different story, doesn't it? The Bible tells the story of God who is so intimately involved in creation that without that involvement, we have no breath. That his breath is given to us as our breath. God was not only portraying humans' total dependency, but also showing his desire for a relationship with the human. The Hebrew word for being is nephesh, and its Greek equivalent is psyche. The same word is used to describe other created beings in Genesis 1, 20 through 21, and in 24, but they're, they're translated living creatures. Nephesh is also translated soul on a number of occasions in the Old Testament. But the idea behind the word is linked to the, the throat or the neck and accordingly has the connotation of desire, hunger, appetite, as in a longing for. So what we are told is that we were created as longing creatures, creatures with an appetite. But an appetite for what? For relationship. A relationship with our Creator. And our lives are not right when we are not in relationship with the Creator. When we are not in right relationship with God, there's something wrong in us. Because his breath is our breath. His life is our life. This is portrayed in one of my favorite psalms, Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul, or nefesh, longs for you. All the living creatures of the created order live only because of God. But humanity was created in such a way that his being, or psyche, would long deeply for fulfillment and satisfaction. And that the creation accounts shows clearly that the fulfillment would come only from the breath of life. Only from the breath of God, the breath of life given to us, fulfills our deepest desires. Whether or not we are to picture God breathing into man's nostrils in much the same way that a lifeguard breathes life into a drowning victim, or we see it as more figuratively, it's clear The image presented is one of the closest possible contact and relationship between God and humanity that could be given. It's direct and immediate, and without it, we would not have life. This closeness of relationship, which sets humanity apart from the rest of creation, is further illustrated by the specific commands which God gave to man. God said, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Verses 16 and 17. And in so doing, show that humanity was capable of relating to God at the deepest level possible of commitment and obedience and with our volition And with our will, God desires that our will would be in line with his will. There is a popular contemporary Christian song that says, Oh God, might my heart break for the things that break your heart. That our will would be consistent with his will. God wants our desire to be consistent with his desire. For us to be obedient to the things which he cares about. He was able to hear, understand, elevate, and determine what God was saying to him was Adam. And then decide what he would do about it. 
Man as a natural being was able to live in tune with earth, but as a spiritual being was equipped to live in touch with heaven to suggest, as some have done, that humanity is a naked ape and nothing more is to fall desperately short of the truth revealed in Genesis chapter 2. We were created as spiritual beings, an imprint of the image of God on us. We were also created to be productive beings. At one stage in the creation process, the Lord had got, God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground, verses 5 and 6. At a later stage, however, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it, verse 15. Clearly, God's intention from the beginning was to put humanity to work. Work was not the product of the fall. Work would become difficult because of the fall. But work existed prior to the fall. And in fact, what is our very first image of God? Our very first image of God is that God himself is a worker. God does not exist in some kind of eternal retirement, some kind of eternal feet up in barca lounger kind of image. No, God is productive. God is at work. And thank God, literally thank God, that he continues to work and attend to his creation today because left up to us it would have been destroyed long ago if God was not at continuing work in his creation. So just as God is a worker, we were created as workers to have good, productive, meaningful, dignified work. Work which would produce for us the things needed for the joy and the sustenance of life and the relationships that we would have. We were created to be productive. Clearly God's intention from the beginning was to put us to work. It's true, as we shall see later, that as I said, because of the fall, work would become a drudgery. Because of sin, work has something not only which God intended for man to do, but also something that would be difficult, but that's not as it was originally intended. That's our distortion of it. The creation order is specifically straightforward. Man, humanity, is to work, but also we are to rest properly. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Friends, one of the great challenges of Western civilization is that, at least in the United States, if we have a, one of the great sins is we work too much. We don't know how to rest appropriately. And so our work is, is not enjoyed. Our work is not productive. Our work is diminished because we don't know how to rest. God built into the created order this restness. Time won't allow me here, but um, I have preached on Sabbath. I did a whole series of sermons. It was about six in total a, a couple of years ago. Sabbath is important. Sabbath is important as a part of the order in which God created things. It is significant that Sabbath rest, which was to become such a distinctive feature of the lifestyle of God's people, was introduced by God at the very beginning of creation. Humanity's ignoring of it may be far more detrimental to ourselves physically, socially, and spiritually than we realize. On an entirely different level, it's interesting to note Snow White's dwarfs may have been nearer the mark than many people in the modern world. For they sang and they whistled as they went off to work. What a great image of work and productivity, something we do with joy and we look forward to. And so we were created to be productive, part of the image of God stamped in humanity. 
but we were also created as rational beings. Roger Kipling's commentary on Genesis may not rank with Calvin's, but he had a point when he wrote, O Adam was a gardener, and God, made, and God who made him sees the half of a popular gardener's work is done upon his knees. The other half, as far as Adam was concerned, required him to use his head because the Lord God had a mammoth task for Adam. In verse 19, out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called every living creature, that was its name. The cooperative action initiated by the Lord God gave Adam the opportunity to discover the intellectual capacities, the rational abilities that God had put in him as the crown of his creation. Some see the naming process as indicative of Adam's authority over animals, and this indeed might be the case. But there's no doubt that when Adam gave names, he was describing that which he discovered through observation. He used his rational mind in the naming and the categorization of things, and we've been at that ever since, haven't we? Perhaps this was the birth of scientific observation and analysis right there in the garden. We indeed are rational beings. God created order out of chaos. And as rational beings, we are to apply the order of God into the chaos of a sinful world that makes sense of it all. That is part of the imprint of God's nature and the image of God on humanity, that we are rational, but we are also a moral being. There were limits to Adam's knowledge, because the Lord God commanded the man, and in Hebrew, that's Adam, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. 2, verses 16 and 17. Adam, like the rest of the animals, was made from the ground. It's no coincidence that the word Adam is the Hebrew word for man, and Adama is the Hebrew word for ground. Adam taken from Adama. The common groundedness of humanity and animals is demonstrated not only in their physical similarities, but also in similar behavior patterns as Pavlov showed with his dogs and Skinner demonstrated with pigeons, animal behavior can be modified. It can be trained. It can be coerced. It can be funneled in a certain direction. And just as animals can be manipulated into certain behaviors, we as human beings can be manipulated, can't we? There's a current documentary about social media that many might want to watch and discover how they're being manipulated. We can rationally figure out how to manipulate one another. But we are moral beings. And we have to ask ourselves the question, is it right to do so? You see, we have the capacity to ask not just the rational question, but the moral question. And that places us unique as the crown of creation among all of God's created order. When taken to its extreme, this ability to modify human behavior and controls leads to the question, who controls who? And who decides what is best? And how do we avoid such control being used in an unethical or immoral way? You see, our rational abilities need to be tamed by our moral capacity. Otherwise, history is replete with rational abilities unfettered with moral doctrines. And we see how ugly humanity can be to humanity. And that people are used as merely test before they're destroyed in concentration camps. 
That's a rationality unfettered by morality. And Genesis 2 makes it clear that we were created as moral creatures. As people who have to decide, will we be moral? Will we follow God's command? Will we refrain from eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Or will we not? We were created with people who have moral decisions to make. And this was introduced right in the very beginning of creation. Like our creator, we are moral. And in being moral, we see the imprint, the image of God. On humanity. According to Genesis 1, when God surveyed his creation piece by piece, he affirmed it as good. And we saw his finished work, he said it was very good. But friends, there was a fly in the ointment. In verse 18 we read, and then God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. For the first time, God announces something is not good in his creation. And it has to do with humanity's sense of isolation and his inability to reproduce himself according to the divine instructions. The helper equal to him was absolutely necessary. Friends, one of the greatest tragedies I think we're going to discover when things go back to normal and we see the residue of our lockdowns and isolation is that many people will have suffered greatly during this time because of lack of social interaction and relationship. Particularly many of our elderly are struggling even in this moment isolated and fearful because they have been cut off from their primary relationships. Relationships that the book of Genesis in chapter 2 says are necessary components of our existence. God is a relational God and we were created to be in relationship to that God. And when we are isolated from one another, we see the devastating impact In our criminal justice system, one of the harshest penalties is to do what? Put someone in isolation. Cut off from anyone else. Psychologists tell us if somebody remains in that state too long, very, very bad things begin to happen in one's mind. Child development specialists tell us if a child is not hugged, if a child is not held, if a child does not feel its mother and father's body and hear their heartbeat at the earliest of stages, there are significant deformities intellectually and psychologically for the rest of their life. Isolation is one of the cruelest things that humanity can do to humanity. And we see right here in Genesis chapter 2, we were not created to be isolated. We were created for a relationship. All of the components were there, but God said it's not good. Why? Because man has no one to relate to. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and the rib which God, the Lord God had taken from man, and he made it into a woman. Verses 21 and 22. This beautiful, perfect woman was presented by God to the revived Adam, who immediately recognized that she was uniquely a part of him. She was different from all the rest of creation. They were of one flesh. They were of the same image, the image of God. The estrangement and distance which he had felt so poignantly as he reviewed the rest of creation was gone. They were truly meant for each other. The relationship between man and woman was designed as an equal and complementary relationship, egalitarian at its very heart. The scripture describes woman as man's helper. And the Hebrew word used for helper occurs 21 times in the Old Testament. 
And on 15 of those 21 occasions, it refers to God helping man in one way or another. So the word which defines woman as helper is not meant to be a subservient word. Because the same word is used to describe God helping us. And certainly the scripture isn't saying God is subservient to us. But helper is complementary, egalitarian. It has an equality and a dignity about it. A fact which puts to rest the sinful idea that woman as man's helper is inferior person in any way. When man saw woman, he was so excited that he exclaimed, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of me. The expression translated, This is now, is really an exclamation of delight. Finally! You brought all this other before me. Finally, wow, one like me, I'm completed. I have one to be in relationship with. Up until now, Adam has been the word used for man, as we've unpacked. But now, beginning with these verses, the word used is ish. Ish is used to describe Adam. And Isha is used to describe woman. Remember back when we unpacked how Adam came from Adama for earth, and now Isha comes from Ish? And the relationship, the Hebrew connection between man and woman is integral and beautiful and complementary. God is a relational God, and creation is a repetition of that nature of God in time and space. And so we are created to be relational, male and female, of every race and every tribe and every tongue, is to be in right, dignified relationship with one another. In being relational, we see the imprint of God on humanity as God's crown of creation. In our first parents, we see that all of humanity, regardless of external differences, were created in this image of God, and therefore all of humanity and all of human beings deserve to be regarded with one another with the same dignity. Why? Because we were given that dignity by our Creator. Equally, all of us, regardless of where we are in our development, from our very first moments in the womb to our last breath, whether we are male or female, whatever race or background, Genesis 2 proclaims loudly that all humanity is created in the image of God and all humanity deserves equal dignity and honor as the pinnacle of God's creation. We are not given the ability to undignify any human. Because God has placed his dignity through his image in each one. Psalm 8 clearly declares how humanity, all of humanity, is to be understood. But if we need any greater evidence how God views humanity, the cross gives us that image, doesn't it? How does God view this humanity? God views this humanity as precious enough to become one of us to die for us that we would be united with God. And what a beautiful, beautiful image. The scriptures describe Jesus as the second Adam, an idea we're going to unpack more next week. We see the value God places on humanity and that Jesus came to die. That image of God and the dignity of humanity would be restored. Racism, sexism, bigotry, and any form of discrimination against God's crown of creation violate the clear teaching of Genesis chapter 2. The dignity and glory of each of God's created in the image of God. All the rest of scripture is to be understood in the light of this reality. And any interpretation of any scripture devoid of this fundamental understanding of the basic dignity of any human is a misinterpretation of any of the rest of the scriptures. God put this first for a reason. So it would be foundational for us understanding the rest 
of the narrative and story. All of humanity has our common first parents, and in that we share an equal and common humanity. We were created to reflect and show forth the glory of God, and unlike the rest of creation which reflects his glory, we were uniquely and wonderfully made in his image to powerfully reflect that image. Let me end with the words from Psalm 8, a psalm many believe to be David, King David's commentary on Genesis 2. Psalm 8, Divine Majesty and Human Dignity is the title the Hebrew gives it. Divine Majesty and Human Dignity. To the leader, according to the Getith, a psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, the children of Adam that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the fields, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That's what Genesis 2 means. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you pray with me? Almighty and gracious God, we come to you in awe of your creative ability and power and majesty. You who created, redeem, and sustain your creation. And, O Lord, there is more evidence than we would ever want to admit that we have marred and not done what is right. We have not used our rational, moral, or even our physical components that you have placed in us in such a way as to always declare your glory. Send your Holy Spirit to reawaken us to the task of declaring your glory and the dignity of all people. Give us the courage to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves, to stand up for others. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We pray for the nations of the world and we pray for our nation, for our president and Congress, for our state, governor and legislators, for our county commissioners and city officials, and for all of those you have placed in positions of authority, administrators and bureaucrats and officials. Lord, their decisions affect the well-being of so many. Give them wisdom, give them compassion. Help each of us to look beyond our own selfish ambition or desires to see your will and to more profoundly than we ever have before understand your kingdom. And to this end, O Lord, we use the words of the prayer of your kingdom that our Lord taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand for our closing song, even as we say goodbye to those who have been joining with us on Facebook. Have a great day.